Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Nina Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute. And it's my honor to introduce our uh, very distinguished panel today to talk about um, the religious cleansing in northern Nigeria at the hands of Boko Haram. And we have as our guest speakers today um, Adamu Habila uh, from Nigeria. He is the sole survivor of a massacre of Boko Haram, um, one of the many massacres. And as far as we know, he's the first witness, eyewitness, to come to Washington to publicly speak about his ordeal. Um, Emmanuel Ogabe is uh, known to those of us, well known to those of us in Washington who uh, work on persecution issues because he is an international uh, human rights lawyer, an expert in bilateral relations between the United States and Nigeria. Um, he founded Justice for Jos, which is a project to um, uh, seek redress for victims of Boko Haram. And, um, and Buwalda, of course, um, is a, a longtime friend of the Center for Religious Freedom. She's an attorney and law professor and the executive director of Jubilee Campaign, which focuses on international religious freedom and the plights of religion-based uh, uh, asylum and refugee uh, issues. And um, she, uh, well, all three of our guests today have recently come from Nigeria. And um, Mr. Habila and Mr. Ogabe both testified in Congress yesterday before Congressman Chris Smith's sub Subcommittee on African Human Rights. And their testimony can be found if you Google um, Africa Subcommittee um, Boko Haram. Uh, and that was yesterday, November 13th. That's already up online. Um, and of course, yesterday, and it's no coincidence, I might add, uh, was momentous in this whole um, uh, timeline of this issue because the State Department of the United States finally designated Boko Haram as a terrorist, a foreign terrorist group. Um, and this will have enormous uh, policy consequences. For example, it will allow Treasury Department to start investigating who's supporting Boko Haram. Boko Haram has been around since 2009 and emerged from another um, uh, violent Islamist movement in northern Nigeria. Its name means Western education is forbidden um, or a sin. Uh, its goal is to establish a Sharia state in Nigeria or northern Nigeria. Um, and, um, and it uh, will kill anybody and has a policy of killing anyone who stands in their way. And this, of course, includes um, in particular Christians. Uh, my uh, researcher, our researcher at the Center for Religious Freedom last summer documented uh, about 60 churches that have been attacked, blown up, or burned by Boko Haram in just the last few years. Some of them, um, like St. Teresa's Catholic Church in Abuja on Christmas in um, 2010, or in um, the Christian Assembly Church in, uh, uh, in, in, in Easter 2012, were full of worshipers at the time that they were attacked. And that has continued through this year as well. Um, the, um, uh, they also, Boko Haram also among its victims, attacks uh, UN offices, police stations, mosques, and um, and Muslims who oppose them. For example, just last September, an agricultural college was attacked and its sleeping students gunned down in their dorms um, because they were violating the um, policy that Western education is a sin. They were studying agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, the State Department designation linked Boko Haram with Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So, um, I, without further uh, ado, I, I know you're all eager to hear our guests, so please join me in welcoming our guests. And we're going to um, start with Emmanuel, and, um, 
then after each of them have finished, um, after all of them have finished, we will have time for Q&A. Thank you very much. Do you want to stay there or come up? It's up to you. Yeah, I, I think after my hard labor yesterday, I want to <laughs> chill. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Nina, for always you know, being uh, there for us uh, when we have guests from out of town and we're looking at the issues uh, surrounding Nigeria. Um, Nina mentioned a uh, testimony in Congress yesterday. We're going to make copies of that available to you momentarily. Uh, but an interesting thing happened a few hours after I submitted my testimony to Congress uh, the day before yesterday, which illustrates how Washington works. Uh, a few hours later, I got a text from the sole survivor of a massacre uh, who's been in hospital in London for the last two years. And he said, uh, Reuters just tweeted that the Obama administration is uh, going to designate Boko Haram an FTO. I, I got this text probably about 8 p.m. on uh, Tuesday night. Now, I had just left the Hill an hour before and no one there had said anything. Uh, by yesterday morning on my way to the Hill, uh, I got an email from Anne here saying you need to go to the White House website. I've just sent you the link and I opened it and the administration had uh, uh, designated Boko Haram as an FTO. So my 15 page uh, testimony was completely knocked out of the water. Uh, without, I, I, I spent so much time researching that, that I need to share that with someone uh, to have personal closure. So I'll give you a few of the highlights of what the Obamas didn't want you to hear or see. Um, there were three main issues we were very worried about. One of them was that Boko Haram is not a potential threat to the U.S. It has already attacked U.S. nationals. I was in Abuja in August of 2011 when the U.N. building, which is uh, two blocks away from the U.S. Embassy, was bombed. And there were two American individuals in that building. One of them was a friend of mine. She and I were on a panel the previous week. And we were planning to meet that day before I flew back to the States. And she was in the building. The second person, shockingly, was a U.S. diplomat in the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria. The two of them, fortunately, did not die. So why we spent the last two years debating whether this group is a potential threat to the U.S. makes no sense whatsoever. And a lot of the time we spent on advocacy uh, would have been better spent on victim care and other issues than fighting with a Washington bureaucracy. So um, that was one concern. Uh, the paper has been distributed now, so I will, I will let you find out for yourselves the rest of the issues. But let's take a look into the world of Boko Haram. Uh, Boko Haram is... Uh, a group whose name literally means everything Western, Western is evil. They first started out as the uh, Yobe or, uh, or Nigerian Taliban. Uh, does that sound familiar? Their camp at the time was named Afghanistan. And they emerged in 2003. Now, let's do the math. What was happening about that time? The U.S. had invaded... Uh, Afghanistan, Nigerians, Muslims, were found fighting alongside Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. So the tie to global jihad has existed for as long as, you know, there's been Google. <laughs> and for some reason, up till last year, the U.S. was saying, well, you know, they are local. We don't think they have any ties to global jihad. But they were modeled on, uh, 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 on Afghanistan. In September, Anne and I visited the mountain ranges uh, where the terrorists have retreated to. Here's what happened. 
when the U.S. Uh, supported the French troops to go into northern Mali to kick out the uh, Taregs and the jihadi squad over on northern Mali, what happened was that they fled and accompanied G uh, Boko Haram elements who were operating and training in northern Mali into northern Nigeria. So they were not squelched, they were simply redeployed. So they're now operating in northern uh, Nigeria, in the border regions with Cameroon. And so we were in that part of the country trying to get to the refugee camps in Cameroon. And as we, as we were sleeping in the hotel, that same night, two churches were burnt mm -hmm. as we lay sleeping. We woke up, our guides, and we got calls and texts, you can't go any further. So we literally had to have a, a meeting with the refugees and turn around and head back. But that is the condition uh, right now. They still control territory in northern Nigeria. Here's one of the superb ironies. Boko Haram was operating in northern Mali at the same time it was operating in northern Nigeria. In northern Mali, the U.S., France, and African troops built a coalition to fight them. In northern Nigeria, the U.S. was issuing press statements criticizing the Nigerian military response to Boko Haram. Another illustration of the absurdity of the situation was Ansaru was operating in northern uh, Mali. Ansaru was also operating in northern Nigeria where they abducted seven Westerners and executed them. The British government designated Ansaru uh, a terrorist organization in northern Mali, but would not do so for northern Nigeria. So we, we, it, the, the whole debate around designation was ludicrous. Unfortunately, the Brits eventually uh, 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 proscribed uh, Boko Haram and uh, Ansaru in Nigeria uh, a few months ago. But they did that at a great price because the, several Brits have been killed uh, by... Uh, Boko Haram already. Now, let me just uh, give you a snapshot into some of the crazy things they've done. And I want to make clear, Boko Haram has existed for 10 years. December of this year will mark the anniversary of their first attack. Now, this is not a group that has any legitimate grievance that anyone else does not have. There's no special grievance they have beyond what everyone else has. They are a warped theology-driven organization who feel that they must implement um, medieval-style Islamic practices. The rise of Boko Haram is a classic example of what appeasement does. Now, in, two, in 1999, Nigeria returned to democracy. And because of the elections that replaced dictatorship, uh, we found a situation where a Christian was elected president uh, for the first time. And so what happened was governors within 12 Sharia, uh, northern states uh, announced that they were going to introduce Islamic Sharia law within their states in violation of the Constitution. Now, the president was troubled by this development, but he, he didn't feel he had the political power to do it. And so they went ahead and installed Sharia in their states. Now, the result was a woman went to court uh, to seek uh, custody, uh, so not custody, alimony or child support for her child. And the judge said to her, um, were you married to him? And she said no. And he said, okay, you're sentenced to death. Now, this was what happened um, in the official Sharia that was instituted by state governments. Boko Haram was not satisfied with that kind of Sharia. They wanted to have, you know, stadiums where people would be beheaded the way they did in, in Afghanistan. And so, even though we tolerated the Sharia that they instituted to sort of appease them, they wanted more and more and more and more and more. Ministries of religious affairs were created for them. 
uh, instead, uh, and, and of course, there were no, there was no Christian representation. Mm -hmm. Christians were impacted by the imposition of Sharia. They just kept thirsting for more and more and more. And this is why we're where we are now. Um, I will say this, that after the <coughs> government of Nigeria um, cracked down on them, uh, they went on the ground for a while. But before they were cracked down on, and in the narrative we see out there, this isn't well this is not well reported. Even one of my co-panelists yesterday said, oh, they became jihadists in 2009 after their leader was killed. That is arrant nonsense. They have been attacking and killing for the last decade. But here's the thing. A few days before the government finally clamped down on them, they had gone around town, abducted a bunch of pastors, taking them to their camp. They operated in broad daylight. They said, convert or die. And the pastor refused to com convert, a, a gentleman from my tribe. And he was beheaded right there in the, in the heart of town. And so uh, in the violence that followed, three, four days of them going around shooting up uh, police stations and prisons, the, the, the army just had to go in and, and shut them down. But before all of this happened, let me mention two things that had happened. Uh, the government had tried to prosecute them, but they kept being released. Uh, there was always some kind of peace arrangement, you know, we'll talk to them, uh, you know, hand them over to religious leaders you know, to, to, to speak with them. The, a Muslim president who took over from the, from the Nigerian Christian president flew them, the leader in a presidential jet to have talks with him and say, hey, listen, I am Muslim like you. It was in my state that we sentenced a woman to death for adultery. So why don't you guys ease up? And they refused to ease up. So for 10 years, they've been doing all of this. And it, there's a history of them always referencing the U.S. Mm -hmm. They talked about, oh, you know, the religion of Bush. Oh, you know, look at what the Americans are doing in Gitmo. Look at what they're doing in Iraq. So it, it blows my mind that we have a U.S. embassy with the largest political section in uh, in the African continent, and they don't have records of all of this. You have uh, Ambassador Campbell for crying out loud saying that Boko Haram is not a threat to the United States. I mean, we've been paying, we've actually been using tax dollars to pay him to go on a hike in Africa. Now, he, l let me say this uh, for point of emphasis. We do not have, uh, suicide is not a, a common phenomenon in Nigeria, and suicide bombing uh, only recently emerged. In the history of Nigeria, let me tell you what the first five suicide bombings, bomb, bombings by Nigerians were. The first was a gentleman who got on a plane from Amsterdam to Detroit and tried to blow it up. That was the first we ever heard of that, the underwear bomber. The second suicide bomber blew up uh, the police headquarters. The third blew up the UN building, and then the fourth blew up St. Teresa's Church. I will say this without fear of contradiction. No mosque has been blown up by Boko Haram. There was one attempt in July last year to, um, targeted at a, compu uh, a, a, a leader, a Muslim leader, who had uh, criticized them. He issued a fatwa against them. And it was outside the mosque, not inside the mosque, and it, it was unsuccessful. And so when I hear State Department say, oh, they're blowing up churches, they're blowing up mosques, it, it sounds really strange uh, to me. Last year, we had 47 attacks on churches, and there were three, at the most three, attacks around or close to mosques. And yet, they've established some idea that, oh, this is a group that is just going around killing everyone. So to wrap up here, let me say this. Boko Haram has evolved strategically um, to where it's a real global threat. Um, as I mentioned, the arms from northern Mali, fighters from northern Mali are now uh, in northern Nigeria. We also had the arms from post-Gaddafi Libya end up in northern Nigeria. Now, when the U.S. You know, spent, apparently they had a program, a, a buy, missile buyback program, go figure, um, it, it, it worked in Syria and in a few places, but there was none 
in northern Nigeria, as far as we know. And we hear that, you know, the prices of weapons in Nigeria has just crashed because there's uh, such a huge uh, supply uh, since uh, uh, Libya, uh, the regime change in Libya. So Nigeria has been impacted by two actions that the U.S. was directly involved in. And when Nigeria tries to respond, you have all this criticism. But let me, let me wrap up my thoughts here with um, a few um, illustrations of the trajectory. Uh, the president of Nigeria, uh, because of the pressure the U.S. was putting on him, oh, this is economic, you know, don't, you, you don't need a military solution, you know, give them more money. He was waffling. And it wasn't until he was told that about 17 counties out of 29 had fallen to the terrorists. Terrorists had actually captured territory that he realized, you know what, I, I can't keep listening to this stuff. We need to send the army in. And so the state of emergency was declared. The army went in. So we have a situation now where there is slightly better protection for churches. But if you go to Damaturu, where um, out of 77 churches, only five are still open. Uh, if you talk to the Catholic priest who says out of 51 churches in his diocese, only one is left, uh, hasn't been attacked. You say, well, this, this came in rather late. And so we have that situation now. The troops are there. They're trying to hold things down. Boko Haram has evolved a new strategy. What they now do is, as, a, as occurred when we were there in September, they went to a highway dressed as the military, made a checkpoint, <coughs> And they stopped all the cars. It was like a 10-mile, you know, backup. Uh, you know, really worse than uh, our beltway here. But here's what they did. They would ask your name and do an ID check. And they killed 152 Christians by ID check. Now, when they were done, they killed 19 Muslims who had government-issued IDs that showed that they worked for the government or local county or for the security forces. Now, here's the third thing they did, which was really unique. They abducted the Muslims who did not have IDs. So I was curious. This is a new pattern. What's going on? Fortunately, we rescued a, Muslim, uh, uh, a Christian woman who escaped from one, one of their camps. And she told us that Muslim men who are abducted and brought to the camps are then trained uh, in weapons and conscripted into the insurgency. Uh, another Christian woman that was rescued told us how she was forced to convert and she was also trained uh, in how to use an AK-47. So this year, you may not hear as much about the church attacks because of two things. One, that the military is really out there in full force. But two, the military has clamped down communications. So it's much more difficult for us to find data. Uh, so we, we can't even tell if there are way more churches than what we have on record. Uh, there are widows and people I try to reach we have not been able to communicate with for two months. I don't know if they're dead or if it's because of the shutdown of their communications. So that's the situation we have now where they, they go and do random fishing expeditions. I did the Christians kill them ID the Muslims who are uh, government workers and kill them. This is a new trend, the killing, random killing of uh, Muslim, Muslims who are government workers. Before now, the only attacks on Muslims were targeted assassinations of critics. So I want to make that uh, uh, very clear. Um, I think the last thought I will leave you with is this. Last year, we had the horrendous situation where they would mark the homes of Christians with graffiti and come back at night and kill all the males. And the Christians wised up to that. We found this out in March during a trip, sorry, in February during a trip there. And so we asked the Christian IDPs who had fled, yeah. you know, how do you cope with this? Oh, now we've asked all the men not to sleep in the house. By the time I went in, in March, a month later, the terrorists had wised up to this uh, strategy. And here's what they did. 
they, they, they now trail Christians during the daytime. And it's very easy to tell a Christian. Now, a Christian would be dressed as I am. A Muslim would be dressed as he is. So if, if, if they come here, it's easy uh, to determine who is a Christian and who is a, who is a Muslim. So they trail Christians during the daytime and they shot them. Uh, so this is just to show you how you know, resilient they are in their, in their tactics. I will, uh, I will round up by making one quick statement about um, this uh, document. We documented the attacks from last year. And one of the sad things for me is when I meet a victim and they are not recorded here. Um, la yesterday, Habila flipped through this calendar and he pointed out, do you know my attack is not recorded in your, in your report? In his attack, the night they attacked their community, they wiped out all the Christians in his neighborhood. Fourteen people were killed and they are not even in the records that we have. And uh, I will conclude by saying, uh, one of the comments we made in this uh, report, we quoted Senator uh, Clinton, and she said last year, uh, our goal is to inform more people about this crisis, these attacks. The attacks are mul multiplying at an alarming rate. Secretary Clinton was speaking about the slaughter of African elephants in December 2012. Now, I thought that with her gone, you know, with Kerry and, you know, the new assistant secretary, you know, I wouldn't have to hear about the slaughter of African elephants anymore. But today I was watching the news and Hillary Clinton apparently is asking the Clinton Foundation to work on this issue that is still agitating her mind since she left office, the slaughter of African elephants. And so I will say this, that if, Christ, if, if elephants were being slaughtered the way Christians are being slaughtered in northern Nigeria, people would be protesting. People would be speaking out the way Hillary Clinton is doing uh, about the African elephants. Thank you very much for... Though I give thanks to God Almighty for keeping me alive up to this moment, I know if not because of God, I am a dead man now, 11th month, but because of His grace, I am still alive in order to testify the goodness of God in my life and the work of God in my life. God is God, is unchangeable God. Though that is a day that one church invited me for a program. We have discussed about Jesus. This, what is happening to us now, and it's already said in the Bible, in the book of John chapter 16, that these things will happen to us. More than 2,000 years ago, I give God the glory. So my name is Habila Adamu. I am from Yobe, northern part of Nigeria. On 28th November, the gunmen come to my house, ordered me to come out. My thought they are Nigerian army going around the night patrolling. But when I opened my door, my sitting room door, 
I am shocked. The way I see their dresses with their marks. I shifted back because of fear. My wife moved <coughs> further. When she see them, she begged, she started begging, please leave my husband to live. And one of them told my wife that we are here to do the work of Allah. When I heard that, I know that this is the day that the Lord has made for me to see him. I use a few time to pray to Almighty God in order to accept my soul. I say, Lord, here I am. I cannot save myself. I am a sinner. Lord, forgive me. Today, your servant will visit you. Lord, accept my soul. When I finish, I move forward. Because they are there for me. I move forward. I told my wife, they are there for me. <clears throat> the leader asked me, can we have the key of the door? And I give them the key. One of them opened the door. <clears throat> I know that two people come inside with AK-47, making four in my house. Ordered me to sit in their front. I did so. The leader asked my name. What is your name? I told him, Habila Adamu. Are you a Nigerian army? I say no. Are you a Nigerian police? I say no. Security service? I say no. I am a businessman. Said, that is good. Are you a Christian? I say, yes, I am a Christian. He told me, why? We are preaching the message of Muhammad to you. You refuse to accept Islam as a religion. And I told them that I am a Christian. We are also preaching the good news to you and other people that never know God. Now the leader now asked me, okay. Did, you want to tell me that you Christians know God? I say, yes. We know God, the true God. That's why we are preaching to you people. You know, my wife, she's afraid because she knows that they are determined. She went inside and gave them the money that we have. She, they have collected the money. They have collected our uh, handsets cell phones and the leader now asks me uh, Abila you can live a good life in this earth but if you can deny your faith and I told him that I am a Christian say that he called my wife to be a witness with what will happen to me if I refuse to accept the offer, he told my wife to beg me so that we will live life together. And he asked me, Habila, are you ready to die as a Christian? I say, yes, I am ready. I will ask you for the last time whether you will change your mind. Are you ready to die as a Christian? I say yes. Before I close my mouth, one of them fired me with AK-47. Here. Closed rent. That is where the bullet has entered from my nose here. This is the exit place of the bullet. AK-47. I fell down with my face. Blood is rushing everywhere. One of them followed me, stepped on me two times to confirm whether I am still alive or dead. 
they have found that I am dead. They have shout Allahu Akbar, mean Allah is great. They have left the house. Even my wife thought that I am dead. When I am there, I am waiting to see the new kingdom that God has put fair for us. I am still waiting to see an angel hold my hands and say, Habila, this is your place. But unfortunately, I have, I had my wife crying. She's crying, meditating, saying many things. She said, God, why God? Why did you take my husband at this moment? Why did you not leave my husband in order to raise our children together? What can I talk when my children ask me about their father? What can I tell them? Lord, I know where my husband is. Lord, give my children the heart to stand in their faith in this condition. Also, give me the heart to stand in this wicked generation. When I hurt her, because I don't want her to sin against God, I raise my head and I told her that I am still alive. I am alive. She is shocked. She told me that the way I am bleeding, I cannot survive. I know I will not survive because I'm already give up. And I told her that even though I will die, I have a message, please, to everyone that will hurt my story when I leave this world. I told her that to live in this world is to live for Christ. To die is again. That is my message. I never knew that I am the one that I will spread the message to the world. I am still waiting for the Lord. Some hours later, I have started feeling pains everywhere. Pains everywhere. And I urge my wife, please can I have a water to drink so that I will die. She refused to give me. And I called my son. I said, David, please, can I have water to drink? He ran and bring the water, a sachet of water. I found that all this place is broken. Here is empty. I said, thank you, Jesus. And I asked my wife, please, go outside. Find somebody that will help me. When she went out, she found that all the Christians neighbors around has been killed in that night. I am the only survivor in that night. And that night we are, she's there waiting for the time that I will leave. I am bleeding since around 11 p.m. up to 7 a.m. in the morning. 7 a.m. in the morning, my face has been swallowed. My eyes have closed. Couldn't see anything. I have rushed to the hospital in Portisco, in Yobe. All the remaining Christians in Portisco, they are already give up. The doctors have given up. Each one of the Christians around trying to touch me in order to say it, Habila, we will meet in heaven one day. Each of them trying to touch me and turn back with a cry and Habila we will meet in heaven one day.
I am alive. Not because I am worthy to be. But I am alive because God wants you and I to know that he is the resurrection and the life, the power of death and life is in the hands of God. In the book of John 11, 25, it's saying that I am in the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he he will live. You are the pillar that holds my life. You are the pillar that holds my life. Master Jesus, you are the pillar that holds my life. Master Jesus, you are the pillar that holds my life. If I have the opportunity, I will continue from where I stopped. If God keep you alive, no one can touch your life. I asked God when I heard about my neighbors. I said, Lord, why me? Why did you keep me alive? Lord, take my life in order to join the other Christians that are crying, waiting, Lord, the time that you will come and take revenge of what will happen to us in the book of Revelations. I want to be among those members that are waiting for you, Lord. But why me? But God, because of his grace, he wanted to show the world that I am the one that keep her bill at life. You want to testify the world that nothing has passed my power. God did it that the Christians around and even the doctors, the scientists, testify and say, God, we see your hands in the life of Abila. All the veins that are here, they are no more. The veins that supply blood to brain, they have caught, but I still survive. When the doctors before the operation to go through and find that my blood pressure is normal, blood level is normal, everything is normal in the morning. It's a questionable character. <coughs> the bullet entered from here, supposed to come out from here, but he came out from here. Was the force behind it? After two days, the doctor asked me, "Who is wanted to know the force behind this one? What makes the bullet turn?" And I told him that this, the power of Jesus Christ, is the Holy Spirit that turned the bullet to this side. The day of the operation, who oh, I am sorry, this is how my head is. The place is opened like this. And the day of the operations, because the doctor said that he will remove some flesh from my labs in order to fill this place. In the morning when he opened it, he found the place filled with the flesh. He shouted the name, Jesus is afraid. He said that you are not a human being. I say it's the work of God, not I. 
I started questioning myself, Lord, why me? Why me? I am nothing. I never know anything. Why can't you send somebody, not me? I give God the glory. The day of the operations, I don't have anything to pay it for the operations. But I give thanks to voice of the martyrs. When the voice of the martyrs heard about my story, they have paid for the operations. They have paid for my housing and my feelings. Mm. Thank you. I thank voice of martyrs. They have started the good work. Let them continue the good work to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Habila, for that very, very stirring and touching, powerful message that God has given you. For all of us, I believe this is a message for America. I believe it's a message for Europe and the world. And that's the message that uh, that God is powerful. Now, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief. There are many believers uh, that have been martyred. And we have a website, Facts Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, um, factsnigeriaviolence.org. And you can go to that website where you'll find statistics of how many uh, Christians have been killed in the last two years. We're updating this year's numbers, and I believe we're going to exceed last year's numbers. At least 1,200 last year were killed in northern Nigeria. More Christians were killed in northern Nigeria uh, last year than the rest of the than were killed in the rest of the world combined. Now we went there specifically to assist refugees. There's a number of trends this past year that have been changing and mutating in terms of what Boko Haram has been doing, and one of which is they've been um, um, exterminating and forcing Christians to flee out of northern states. Some of those Christians have crossed the border into neighboring states. According to the UN High Commission for Refugees, 10,000 Nigerians have registered, 8,000 in the country of Cameroon, 2,000 in the countries of Niger and Chad. Now, uh, these refugees are in desperate need. These refugees have stories of survival as well. And we had the opportunity to meet with a group of them, of about 150 of them, who had recrossed to meet with us. Um, as Emmanuel mentioned earlier, um, it was too dangerous for us to go uh, to meet with them in Cameroon because of the activity in the area. The night where we were staying, uh, two churches had been burnt down within a 10-mile radius of where we were staying. So the refugees had recrossed to meet with us. We were in a, in a compound. They told us the story how um, on May 25th in Borno State, in their city of Goza, they uh, were set upon by Boko Haram and... Um, in the course of about two weeks, um, uh, numerous churches were burnt down and attacked, and the refugees fled and moved across the border to Cameroon. These refugees are in desperate need. They have uh, humanitarian needs that we would like to see met, and we're hoping that in addition to the UNHCR help and assistance, that there would be assistance from other countries. Our recent uh, turn to the worst is Cameroon's trying to force them back across the border to Nigeria. In fact, about two weeks ago, I think it was a dozen or two dozen were killed as the, the Cameroonian authorities were trying to force them back into Nigeria. Um, the UNHCR has registered, 
them and there are camps for them but new arrivals they're trying to force back so we need to uh, to stand in the gap for the refugees we also need to find ways for them durable solutions for them to either return which is not yet safe to do or otherwise to um, uh, resettle so these are some of the needs now I do want to leave I don't know if we have any time for questions but I know we're running out of time here, so I'll close uh, with just um, asking you all to please pray and asking you to please continue to raise us with our government. We've met the hurdle of uh, having Boko Haram designated as a foreign terrorist organization. However, more needs to be done, much more, especially in the area of assistance and especially in the area of security training and so forth where uh, there's great need for intervention, and our government needs to be proactively supportive of uh, the efforts of the Nigerian authorities to bring security to the north of Nigeria. Thank you. Um, the U.S. policy up until now has been uh, working on the presumption, as uh, the Assistant Secretary Johnny Carson had said, this was um, Secretary Clinton's <coughs> Assistant Secretary for Africa, went to CSIS, another think tank in town, the day after uh, the bombing of, of two of the churches on Easter, and said that, you know, religion <coughs> is not the root of this issue in uh, Nigeria, but it's actually uh, the poor delivery of government services. And, um, and the, the policy that flowed from that very flawed analysis was, of course, you had to then, the U.S. had to fund the neighborhoods that were producing the extremists. So, I mean, this is obviously pr problematic because then you uh, create an incentive for more extremism. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you would, uh, we do have time for um, some questions, and, and if you care to elaborate, uh, and you started to get into this, about what's next. What, what really sh should we be focusing on at this time? I um, mean, obviously, the, the Treasury Department will get involved at this point now that there's designation to find out who's supporting, where the support is coming from for these groups. Um. Excellent. Um, well, you know, the White House and the State Department still has not given up on the economic argument as the cause. With that said, their reports, uh, the State Department reports in past years have been um, very adamant about insisting that Islam or religion, uh, and in, in this sense, a warped or thwarted uh, view of Islam is the cause. They did everything they could to uh, push that idea away. Interestingly, yesterday's statement by Assistant Secretary uh, in her testimony uh, to Congress, she actually admitted that uh, Boko Haram is uh, religious motivated. With that said, the White House statement has the line in it about economics and as does her written testimony submitted online in sh which she read. So they're continuing this idea that poverty in the North and uh, has created this environment of recruitment. Well, that's not where the recruitment's coming from, and that's what the evidence is clear and, and, and shows. Now, um, with regard to um, the, um, um, yeah, the next steps, we would like to see that uh, the United States government redirect its funding. We... The Assistant Secretary yesterday testified that U.S. government money, the question to her was, it, does this money go to victims? Her response was, yes, it goes to victims. That is not accurate. 
Uh, we have uh, submitted Freedom of Information Act requests to USAID. USAID has not yet responded to those with information. What we do know is that U.S. government money, $45 million, has gone to the construction of uh, madrasas, and $4.5 million has gone for interfaith dialogue. As Emmanuel testified yesterday, interfaith dialogue it's not an interfaith problem. Local Muslim uh, inhabitants have been living at peace with the Christian neighbors. That has not been the issue. There's many testimonies with that, with respect to that. Well, 4.5 million for interfaith dialogue, and the madras is 45 million. Yeah, it's support to the madras. There's not so much construction without any knowledge about what's being taught in the schools. I mean, you know, we've asked, we made that request uh, to USAID, we don't know. Now, she was unable to provide additional detail. Um, I guess um, uh, uh, she's going to, you know, respond to the congressman's question further. We need to make sure she does that. We need to hold our government accountable of what they're doing with our taxpayer dollars. and. There does need to be efforts to provide relief and aid to the refugees that have crossed the border, 10,000, and in addition to the IDPs. We have yet to find any IDP who can testify that they've received uh, direct aid outside of the Christian charitable communities. One of the congressmen that we met with while there, he's actually um, uh, from the area uh, uh, around Madugari uh, in Borno State, he testified, or he told us that there are issues uh, with resettlement and bringing the people back uh, that, that needs to be uh, remedied. Uh, we need to support people like him as they present their ideas. Moreover, security is vitally important. Uh, apparently, there's a great need for uh, uh, um, training and, and efforts to ensure that the Nigerian military receive the support they need. That is uh, not provided to them for a variety of reasons. Um, other uh, needs at this point in terms of um, assistance, I think um, I'll, I'll let Emmanuel... Um, answer to yes um, <clears throat> I suppose the the victory we won yesterday I, I'm not sure uh, what the value is uh, the point is you know I understand I've never been in a 12-step program uh, so I you know this is hearsay but I understand that the first step is recognizing the problem now the US has just recognized the problem so we have 11 more steps to go. <laughs> now, instead of signing up for, we signed up for Alcoholics Anonymous instead of Jihadist Anonymous. Uh, so that was, you know, the problem there. But now that they've recognized the problem and they've considered that it's religious, uh, not economic, um, well, they, they, they still have the, its religious and economic uh, argument going. Uh, there are several steps that need to occur. Um, we're thinking technical assistance. Uh, last year while we were out there, a policeman was blown to bits because he was trying to de detonate a bomb with his bare hands. Now, uh, what does it take? to provide that kind of technical assistance. Uh, we have the robots, we have the expertise. Uh, secondly, the US has had a lot of experience dealing with insurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, this is, I love this point. Uh, the US has said to Nigeria, you need to throw more money at these people uh, and it will calm things down. Let me tell you this, the US sent out truckloads of money. They were flown, $100 bills were flown in F, uh, Air Force planes to Iraq and, and literally distributed uh, many years ago, uh, trying to jumpstart the Iraqi economy. 
Has that stopped suicide bombing in Iraq? So, I mean, when you hear some of the uh, responses from the administration, you, you, you kind of say there's got to be another playbook because this, all of this stuff you're saying doesn't make any sense. It hasn't worked. But at least with insurgency, uh, counterinsurgency initiatives, there's lots of experience there, particularly because Boko Haram has modeled itself exactly like the Taliban. They literally are operating out of caves in Borno. That was where we went up to. We took so many photographs of the mountains. It's unbelievable. Now, uh, so there's also need for satellite um, cooperation and intelligence. When 9-11 occurred, the president of Nigeria, when it, it was a Christian president, flew to Washington personally to condole President Bush on what happened in 9-11. Uh, a few months ago, President Obama was going to Africa. And he was scheduled to go to Nigeria. He sent a message to the, the embassy to Nigerian president. Oh, we, we saw fat satellite photographs that your army shot up a village, so I'm canceling my trip to Nigeria. That, that is what is happening with the bilateral relationship. And my question is, if the U.S. had satellites that showed a firefight in a village, how come their satellites didn't show that 17 counties had been taken over by the terrorists and they did not share that information with the government of Nigeria? So th there's, uh, th there's a lot of uh, uh, duplicity in the relationship. Uh, I think the last thought I will throw out here with regard to uh, cooperation is that the Nigerian army has played a significant role in regional peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. Now, you all know that Liberia is the only country in Africa that approaches to, you know, some American lineage. Uh, Monrovia, the capital of Liberia, was named after President Monroe because he was the one who helped, you know, the African Americans go back and start that country. In all the years of war in Liberia, there was not one American soldier on the ground. Guess who was there? The Nigerian army acted on behalf as proxies for the U.S. government. And Nigerian taxpayers spent $12 billion uh, funding those operations until this day are helping preserve uh, Liberia. So they have been used by the U.S. Now, one further illustration, Somalia, the U.S. left peacekeeping after the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia. Guess which army is in Somalia now doing UN peacekeeping? The Nigerian army. So Nigerian army was, is in uh, northern Mali doing peacekeeping in Somalia in nine countries. And you say that you will not provide technical assistance to these people who have been very helpful because you say that they're perpetrating human rights abuses. Uh, I will conclude my statements by giving this caveat. I was imprisoned by the Nigerian army. I was tortured by the Nigerian army, and that's how I came on exile to the States. So for me to say favorable things about them <laughs> is quite a stretch. But the fact of the matter is, I see the impact. I mean, Christianity would have been totally uh, exterminated in northern Nigeria in the last two years but for the presence of the army. It would have been much worse than where we are now. And so, you know, God, God, God bless them. They, they have their problems, they have their issues, but any army that has a homegrown insurgency would have the challenges that we have now because more Nigerian soldiers have died at home than have died in the peacekeeping operations abroad in the last three years. Thank you so much. Uh, it's fantastic to hear the story coming alive and coming to light. I speak with a, I'm not sure if the microphone's on. Let's keep it close to your mouth. Okay. Uh, I've been to Joss. I've reported on Joss. I'm a journalist. Um, I know for a fact that the propaganda war is being won by Muslims partly because of the BBC Houser Service. Mm who does the orientation for senior journalists going out to report on the situation. 
People like Peter Oborn, who reported for The Spectator, The Daily Mail, Unreported World, who was orientated by a Muslim, uh, Muslims in Jos. I followed up his contacts. I know for a fact who he was getting his misinformation from mm -hmm. because I followed up. I suppose my question is, why are we not doing better at the information game? And I've come with very hot news, if you like, about a project that I would like you to uh, tell me whether you believe this is going to work. Iraq, Syria, all sorts of um, uh, scenarios are being covered by citizen journalists with mobile phones. And a friend of mine called Alan Craig has started a project called Capture the Killing, where he's actually taking mobile phones, uh, starting training. He's raised American money to do this. What's lacking is infrastructure in terms of internet coverage. I would like to hear from anybody on the panel or anybody in the audience as to what is being done about the infrastructure issues. If you get ordinary people like Habila, you know, who can actually, who's, you know, can testify, can witness on mobile telephones that can get onto the web so that you, you get a, a global conversation, global outrage. This has been a hidden, a, uh, you know, a hidden outrage for far too long. Uh, we've got to reclaim the dynamic and reclaim the, the information. Yes, uh, I'm familiar with um, uh, Alan Craig's uh, project, and I, I think it's fascinating. And the two cents I gave uh, are this. Now, there is an infrastructure challenge. Uh, for example, uh, the government has shut down telecommunications in Borno State. And one of the Christians, one of the 152 Christians who was beheaded, had traveled to the neighboring state to make a cell phone call to his mom. And on his way back, he was killed. So I, we, we want the um, internet and the cell phone communications, everything back up so that we, we can know what's going on on the ground. But that said, the nature of the Boko Haram attacks, especially the home invasions, are incapable of being documented. Um, to give a quick illustration, in the UK, uh, the guys who beheaded uh, a British soldier. That was captured by uh, uh, CCTV. We don't have much of that infrastructure in Nigeria. But guess what? That beheading is exactly what is going on in Nigeria on a weekly basis. So it shocked you. Uh, we don't have footage of that from Nigeria to share. Uh, the only thing we have that is similar, I, ha I have seen, was the reverse. Well, it was Boko Haram that decapitated a woman, and they, they provided it. So unless Boko Haram gives it to us, the Christian victims, uh, it's kind of tough for, you know, a headless person to, you know, uh, to get that sort of thing out. So those are some of the challenges I, I thought I should share with you. Uh, that said, we have some really horrific pictures we couldn't show to Congress, we couldn't show you. These are after-action pictures. They are still pictures. Uh, I have uh, pictures of a church that was just bombed. So those kinds of incidents we do have. Uh, and I'll be happy to share with you and, and Alan. Are they on facts, um, Nigeria? No. 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 It's just... Uh, McDonald, just back from Africa. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, and thanks again for your testimony, Habila. It was a blessing to hear you twice now. Um, I have two questions. One, uh, we were talking about the need for training um, for the Nigerian army, and I, my personal opinion is that the U.S. government would like the Nigerian army to follow the standard operating procedures that our military is now forced to follow, which means that uh, they wouldn't do a very good job of killing Boko Haram, they'd be, you know, playing cards with them or something. Um, so I just wondered what you thought of that and how we can get around that and how we can change the narrative, like you were saying about the military being so cruel to Boko Haram and seeing this as a war and that there are 
they're supposed to kill the enemy. Um, and then secondly, just uh, is the U.S. government still perpetrating the narrative that Christians make things worse for themselves by actually talking about what happens to them? I know that has been a problem in the past. <clears throat> Could I uh, mention uh, one of the hurdles that the U.S. government is standing on to uh, to specifically not provide technical assistance or training to, as they put it yesterday, specific units is known as the Leahy Amendment. And um, I think it will take an effort to overcome this, this legal constraint that they can point to to say, ah, you know, the law prevents us from assisting the Nigerian army because some units have engaged in human rights violations. So I think a close look needs to be taken at the Leahy Amendments and its applicability to the situation. And as the questions were spoken about yesterday, does this apply to every part of the Nigerian army or military? And clearly it should not. So um, I think we need to look at the legal constraints there uh, in addition to uh, looking at the practical side of what's needed. Yes. Uh, it's interesting, um, uh, your question about the uh, operating procedures for the U.S. Army. Uh, I, I was at a conference with, at the Defense University with some generals uh, who came in from northern Mali, and we had uh, some U.S. generals, and, you know, we're, we're discussing. And they were showing all these fancy slides about how the battle should go on. And a general leaned to me, towards me, and asked me, what's a VEO? And I said, it's a violent extremist organization. And the irony was lost <laughs> on him. <laughs> now, this is a general who is fighting the terrorists, right? And apparently, he doesn't know the name, the fancy name we have in Washington uh, to describe it. He understands the jihadists who are shooting at him. But Washington calls them VEOs, and he was missing the whole presentation because it hasn't trickled down to the field. So, yes, um, that would be a challenge. Uh, while we were out there, the Nigerian military provided uh, protection for the CODEL because northern Nigeria is treated at the same threat level as Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Go figure. Those are two countries that have been in a decades-old war. And this is a country where churches are being blown up. This is not a war. This is, this is a massacre. Um, and so it's ironic that you are relying on them for protection and then you say, well, we can't give them training. But you're benefiting from the protection of, uh, of the forces. So that's uh, a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a, a stunner for me. Um, yeah, I think yeah, that's it. You know, you mentioned the uh, National Defense University, and I can't resist telling this little anecdote. I was, last week, uh, about two weeks ago, I guess, I wrote a piece in National Review Online, where I write a lot, on, um, on uh, Syria. And it was the day that uh, there had been discovered, it was the very day that had been discovered two mass graves in a, in a Christian village um, mm -hmm. where the rebels had just been forced out. And it had happened, the, the massacres there had happened over the last, the prior 10 days. And the Vatican that day had issued a press release um, with the names of those killed and the news that this, mm. these, uh, these graves had been found. Mm. There were dozens of people or the villagers killed. Um, very ancient town, 4,000 years old, 2,000 years of Christianity. And I got um, a response um, to the website uh, to the mailbox general mailbox here at Hudson from a professor at the National Defense University uh, here complaining that my uh, and my whole piece was directed why aren't Christians speaking up about this mm. was the thrust of my my piece complaining to me th about writing about Christians mm. Mm. and that I shouldn't write about this I issue wow. and this was a professor <laughs> teaching our military officers mm. at the National Defense University he didn't give a reason. He just was sounding off. And of course, you must remember that the NDU not only teaches American officers, but they bring in officers from around the world uh, for training as well. So th this would have a global impact. 
And we're now going to be giving training to Libyan uh, military. That's now been approved. Uh, that just came out like a week or two ago. So the, the NDU will be doing that. Uh, hello, uh, Michael Grybowski with the Christian Post. Uh, I was curious as to, um, there was talk about the next steps now, now that Buku Haram has been listed. Um, what, what sort of political uh, support can be found for the next steps? Uh, I mean, is, is there a bill? Is there, is there you know, support at the pillared halls of power, if you may? Well, I mean, this is a tough one. We, we've wasted a lot of man hours. Um, just trying to get the administration to this point. And like I said, we have 11 more steps to go. Uh, Chris Smith had a bill that was going to try and designate Boko Haram. That's the only bill that I'm aware of. And that's now defunct. Uh, so we're going to have to find other issues uh, and mechanisms for, you know, seeking attention. Uh, but with regard to humanitarian assistance, um, there is, I want to call it the develop, development consulting industrial complex. Uh, you know, they are the ones who control where money goes. And this is why, to give a quick illustration, USAID has a project that um, explores extremism. And Nigeria is not one of the countries that they've designated for this research. And they've actually gone out of their way to say that Nigeria is an example of a country where it's not religion that is behind what is happening. So maybe that's the next push. Maybe that's where we're going to say, look, at least study it before you come to a conclusion. I think that's how research works. Um, uh, the other thing is the misdirection of U.S. Uh, funding, USAID funding. Um, this interfaith thing they're doing I keep saying it's an intra-faith issue. Uh, these are extremists within Islam. They need to be reached out to. This is not, out of the 380 incidents we recorded last year, only two incidents in northern Nigeria were Christians um, fighting back. And one of them was after three churches were suicide bombed the same day, including the Sunday school, I mean, there was mayhem in that situation. Three suicide bombings in one day, and uh, Christians fought back. Anyone would in that circumstance. That was in Kaduna, in Kaduna State. Um, the second one was also a bombing of a church in Jos. After the bombing of the church, I mean, Boy Scouts, five Boy Scouts were killed in the church. Um, um, there was an attack of a Muslim motorcyclist who came to the church. And we found out that in some cases the Muslim motorcyclists guide the suicide bomber to the church. So in the church they assumed that he was part of the, the hit team. So, um, you know, that's debatable. So I say that to say that, you know, um, this is a de-radicalization de 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 issue that we should address. This is not an interfaith dialogue issue. Um, so, yeah, those are my quick thoughts. I would like to just mention on that point the fact that there are insurgents coming from other countries, Islamic insurgents. And I think more resources need to be deployed to prevent the crossing across the Nigerian border of insurgents. Now, apparently some of the tactics used to uh, move people uh, are completely deceptive and so forth. But with that said, there definitely needs to be efforts to prevent the crossing of the border of uh, uh, insurgents. It's, it was interesting, once again, turning to the Assistant Secretary's testimony. I think it was Congressman Poe who asked a question to her. Is there any connection with Hezbollah and Iranian? And she, again, as Carson, the previous uh, time uh, the, the subcommittee had a hearing uh, July of, of last year, uh, where Secretary Carson, Assistant Secretary Carson said, no, or I'm unaware. Again, assist, the new Assistant Secretary yesterday said, no, I'm unaware of. 
there have been munitions found to have been uh, received from Hezbollah and Iran. It's even in the Security Council at the United Nations. That How can the U.S. not be aware? How can the Assistant Secretary not be aware of something that it's in the US, U.N. Security Council? So with that said, um, these linkages should be uh, resources should be spent to find them and eliminate the linkages to uh, gaining of munitions. Uh, AK-47s is just one of the munitions that, that they have. Uh, they're finding rocket propelled grenades and launchers and all that stuff. So it's quite sophisticated weaponry and that needs to be stopped. Uh, we, we have time for one last quick question on this side. Hi. Um, Emmanuel, you touched on one of the questions. I have two questions that I have. Um, number one, you were talking about just needing to work within the Muslim community. And one of my questions is, how widespread is public support in the Muslim community for what's happening? And then secondly, um, it seems as though men, Christian men, are targeted. What's happening with the young women um, and girls uh, that, are, that are left behind? Yes, uh, y that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, le let me, again, we've seen an evolution. Um, before they used to leave the women, now they have begun to abduct women. Uh, one of the saddest examples for me is uh, Deborah Shatima. They came to her home, killed her husband, uh, just as he was about to go to church. And the kids were crying. And this evil man took her kids, nine and seven, away. Um, they came back three months later. Are you still a Christian? Yes. And then they shot her son. I, I don't know what state she is in. I frankly don't know. We've tried to move her out of there because they told her to, to get out of town. And she's still there. Uh, Habila just told me she's still there because she's hoping against hope that the kids will come back. It's been over a year. So um, we have seen greater attacks on women now. Uh, we've seen women who are abducted and taken to camps to be their slaves. Uh, one of the girls we rescued uh, five, six weeks ago, uh, uh, she told us that she was forced to convert at gunpoint, at knife point, she, because they were going to slaughter her. But they did not sexually abuse her because they said she was an infidel, so she needed to be purified uh, for 90 days before she would be married off to the head terrorist. And she escaped when the 90 days came up. So they, they have different approaches. Some people are abused, some are not. Uh, but the bottom line is, with the bombings, women are killed, children are killed. The, the methodology is not consistent. At the end of the day, they've killed people in all strata, kids, uh, uh, women, uh, men, and so on and so forth. Your second question was with regard to public support. Now, let, let me say this. They, 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 they achieve their goals through terror and intimidation. Now, while there are people who receive $30 to go out and bomb uh, and, and attack a church, there are others who are forced to. So I know of someone who got a note and he was told, you need to release your car for the work of Allah. And so he, he, he released his car and it was probably used uh, for a suicide bombing episode. So they're going out. I know of a congressman who got a text message on his personal phone saying, we need your contribution for the work of Allah. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And the next text was they sent him the address of his house. So this is, this is what is going on. And I keep saying all that it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. In northern Mali, it happened a, a handful of terrorists took over a whole town because the silent majority couldn't stand up to them. And it's happening again in, in northern Nigeria. Well, I want to thank our panel for what they are doing to bring light to this horrible situation. It's very uh, rare that we get testimony about Nigeria 
and uh, particularly uh, Habila's really very compelling uh, testimony today. So thank you very much.